Mike Todd's mega church, Transformation Church, offered a very disturbing performance on Easter Sunday. Also, ex-collegiate swimmer Riley Gaines was assaulted and ambushed at San Francisco State University last week. We'll get into all of this today. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use promo code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Tuesday. All right, we have had technical difficulties for the past, I don't know, 30 or so minutes. I was supposed to be interviewing James Lindsay today, and he was going to help me break down the Riley Gaines stuff, the corporations like Bud Light choosing to partner with so-called transgender activists and influencers, despite the fact that it's totally disconnected from their audience. And we were going to talk about the Tennessee three. And I was really excited to hear all of his takes on that. And we also had some disagreements. Like he has publicly disagreed with me recently on Twitter. And I really wanted to kind of hash that out with him and hear his thoughts on that. And unfortunately, technology is just not complying with us. And so we couldn't make it happen. So I'm solo today. I probably won't get to go through all of the things that I wanted to talk about with him by myself because I was going to record a very long episode with him and then split it up into two parts. And so it would have probably been at least an hour and a half conversation that we broke up into 45 minute episodes. So I, I won't get to everything that I wanted to talk about today, but I at least wanted to talk about this Riley Gaines story and probably the Dylan Mulvaney thing, even though I really tire, I really tire of talking about that person. Um, and yet I think it does make an important and interesting and kind of scary point about where we are. So first, let me talk about what's happening with Riley Gaines. Now, Riley Gaines, you probably know, you've probably seen her. She is a former University of Kentucky swimmer. She's a 12-time All-American, and she was speaking at San Francisco State University last week and was assaulted by a man in a dress, punched, according to her, by a man in a dress and was mobbed by a violent and radical and rabid crowd of trans left-wing activists. Now, the reason for this is because as a collegiate swimmer, she had to go up against Will slash Leah Thomas. You'll remember that Leah Thomas, previously Will, was also a collegiate swimmer, and he swam for the University of Pennsylvania. He was obviously pretty good, because you don't get to the college level in athletics unless you have good skill. But he was, I don't know, number like 300 or something in the world when it came to men's swimming. And then he decided in college that he was going to start identifying and presenting as a woman. And if you've seen pictures, like not really that different, that different appearance wise, uh, just kind of longer hair, maybe some lip gloss. And this person has been glorified, has been glamorized by Time Magazine, by other outlets, of course, by uh, the leftist media and activists saying what a brave person he is for now competing against women who can never match his strength. Because even if he takes hormones, even if he is on estrogen, which I don't really know if he is. I imagine that he is on some kind of hormone regimen. He still has a much longer wingspan than them. Always will. He still has a greater aerobic and anaerobic capacity. He always will. He has a bigger heart. That means you can pump blood faster. That means you can typically go faster. He has greater bone density. He has greater muscle mass. And why is that? Because he went through male puberty. Once you go through male puberty, the changes that are made in the male body are totally, well, not totally, but um, not entirely reversible. You still have all of the physical benefits that were afforded to you in puberty for the rest of your life. You are never going to be as small as or as weak as the average woman. Yes, a very weak man might be weaker than a very strong woman, but you'll remember, by the way, all of these stories back before we talked about transgender issues of uh, high school boys or amateur boys competing against professional women in sports. Remember the U.S. women's soccer team? They competed against a group of 15-year-old boys. 
of 15 year old soccer player boys and the U S women's soccer team, the U S women's soccer team, professional adult women's soccer players lost to a group of 15 year old boys. That's because you can't compete. Women cannot compete against boys or men who have gone through male puberty. It doesn't matter uh, what age they are, as long as they've gone through puberty and it really doesn't matter what kind of hormones they're on. There is still an inherent and an unfair benefit that those men and boys carry. And so to say that someone like Leah Thomas is brave for competing against people who just aren't going to be able to be as competitive against her as males are, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. It's the exact opposite of brave. Um, it is humiliating, I think, both for him and for everyone around him, but it's also very cowardly. All right, quick pause to tell you about our first sponsor for the day, and that is Carly Jean Los Angeles. You guys have heard me talk about Carly Jean and her company so much. That's because I genuinely love it. I'd be talking about it even if she wasn't a sponsor, even if this company wasn't a sponsor of my show. They make really classic and beautiful, well-fitting clothes for women, really in any season of life and also any season of the year. It's so versatile because it's very basic. It's very simple, which is my style. And it's so well made. It really does just make you feel good in your own skin. That's why she started the company. I've worn Carly Jean Los Angeles pregnant, postpartum, not pregnant or postpartum. And it really does just in every stage of my body and every stage of life make me feel really good when I put their clothes on their jeans. Also, the best. And I love that this company has the same values that you and I do. That's why I love supporting them so much. And so ditch those clothing companies that you know, hate you and your values. And instead shop at Carly Jean Los Angeles, go to Carly Jean Los Angeles.com. Use promo code Ali B a checkout for 20% off, excluding final sale items. Ali B a checkout for 20% off. That's Carly Jean Los Angeles.com. Carly Jean Los Angeles.com. So Riley Gaines, for her part, has spoken up about this and good for her. Good for her. There was a competition that she's spoken about where she actually tied Leah Thomas, which is incredible. Um, and she tells this story. She was on an Outkick podcast. She tells this story about how they tied and there was only one trophy. And so she asked the officials in this competition, okay, why does... Leah get this trophy and I don't, if we both had, like, how did you come to that decision? Because that's what they said. They said, well, we're just going to give him, or they probably said her the trophy, even you, even though y'all had the same time. And they said something, which I think is very, was very mysterious and strange at the time. And they said, well, Leah has to take home the trophy because, uh, he, or they probably said she has to take pictures with the trophy. And so right there, you're seeing that not only are men being able to compete against women, but they are also actually taking precedence over women because of the brave act of dressing up as the opposite sex. Riley has also talked about having to change in front of him, not knowing that she was sharing a locker room with a man and then seeing him get naked, fully intact in front of a bunch of girls. She wasn't informed about this. The girls did not consent to this. This used to constitute a sexual harassment and he would have been kicked out. He would have been screamed out, rightfully so, of the locker room, and he probably would have gotten punished by law. But now we celebrate it and we scream at the girls who are uncomfortable with this. And that's exactly what happened at San Francisco State University. Riley Gaines was giving one of the many speeches that she has given in the past couple of years, talking about fairness and access in women's sports for girls. And I am very thankful that she is using her platform, that she is using her voice for this. I don't even know if she's a conservative. I don't know. I don't know if we align in all of our values, but we do align in this. And I'm very thankful for her perspective. And so she knew she was going into the lion's den if you're going into San Francisco. And here was the reaction. Here was the reaction to her speech. I'm good. 
good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm coming. I'm good. I'm good. Trust me. I'm good. Go ahead. All right. So if you are just listening to that, you can't watch it. Obviously you heard the vitriol. Honestly, it sounds like demonic possession. These people are so incredibly unhinged. They're obviously cussing at her, calling her all of these, interestingly, misogynistic names that only women receive. And they're yelling ridiculous maxims like trans women are women. Again, that's a circular definition. If you can't actually define what woman is, then saying something like trans women are women is the same thing as saying like a cat is a woman. If you can't define cat and you can't define woman, then that saying is meaningless. And so of course they are yelling these meaningless maxims at her and they are chasing her down a hallway. She does have police that's escorting her. She was escorted into a classroom and she had to be barricaded in that classroom while this mob was screaming at her, calling her all of these names, saying things like trans women are women and extorting her saying, you are not allowed to leave this classroom safely until we get money from you. She actually missed her flight because of this. So her life was threatened. She also said she was assaulted twice by a man with a dress. Now I've said before, I think what's underneath a lot of these men transitioning into women is actually a hatred of women, a desire to humiliate themselves, to sissify themselves, but also to humiliate the women around them. I actually think through an addiction to very dark forms of pornography, all pornography is dark, but particularly dark forms of pornography. They have learned this kind of mentality and behavior and them trying to be like women is actually a form of hatred of women. And, um, I think that that is what we absolutely see manifested here. So she actually was able to get, to give her talk and thank God for that, that there were some people that actually did hear truth. Her talk started about 7 30 PM. There were 75 students about respectfully sharing differing views on transgender athletes in sports. Uh, but then this happened as she, as she was leaving. And so the undercover campus cop fled, um, to another room as these people were chasing her. Now, Riley has said that, um, that these campus police officers were different than any kind of campus police officers that she's dealt with before, just very negligent. She said that police skipped out on a meeting that they were supposed to have 90 minutes prior to her speech. They gave her no contingency plan of escape. I've never dealt with a reaction this fierce when I've spoken on a college campus, but I always have security. I always have armed officers and they always talk to you. Hey, I'll be right here. If anything happens, this is where we're going to go. This is the signal that you need to give me. If you ever feel uncomfortable, we'll be posted here. And so even I, who have not dealt with this kind of level of rioting and violence and threats. Even I know that these security officers are supposed to give you a plan of contingency. They're supposed to have meetings with the event organizers, with each other, with the head of security, just to make sure everything is good to go. It's not just your protection that they are interested in. They also should be interested in the protection of the entire campus because you just never know what kind of radicalized weirdo is going to show up with a gun. You absolutely have to have a plan in place. And Riley said this, what I noticed about these police, what they actually admitted to was they didn't feel comfortable asserting themselves in a way that would make them seem as if they were in a position where they could be accused of racism or transphobia. Oh my gosh. How terrifying is this? What cowards don't become police officers. Don't be in the, don't be in the line of work that requires you to offer security to someone, if that's what you're more afraid of. SFSU police have reached out to set up a meeting in an attempt to clarify what happened, but no one else from the university has contacted her, but the university did issue this stunning statement saying, you know, we 
support our trans community. We support our students. We also support free speech. And then they said this after that scene, they said this, thank you to our students who participated peacefully in Thursday evenings event. It took tremendous bravery to stand in a challenging space. Boo hoo. Gosh, our college students are so fragile. Thanks to progressivism. I am proud of the moments the university said where we listened and asked insightful questions. Okay. That's fine. I'm also proud of the moments when our students demonstrated the value of free speech and the right to protest peacefully. These issues do not go away. These values are very much at our core. No condemnation, by the way, in this statement, no condemnation towards the students who were not peaceful, who were actually very violent. There's going to be no, probably no criminal charges against them. Now, Riley has gone on Tucker Carlson and has said, hey, I'm going to do something legally about this. We are going to ensure that there are repercussions against the student, these students. And I hope she's successful in that. There, there absolutely needs to be consequences for people who are acting in this way. No, this is not, this is not um, a celebration of free speech. These students who are screaming down a woman who is simply talking about fairness in women's sports. These are the very people who I guarantee you seriously with a straight face walk around and identify themselves as anti-fascist when they are constantly in the business of suppressing other people's speech. And she brought this up. And I know, as we've said before, it gets tiresome to tiresome to constantly talk about, oh, if this happened in the other direction, or if conservatives were on the side of this, just imagine the response. Yeah, we all know. We all know that we don't live in a world that has the same reactions and responses to conservatives as it does to leftists, because all of the institutions, private and public, are completely captured by this left-wing ideology. And so they're always going to be more sympathetic to even violent left-wing causes. Obviously, we saw that with BLM and with Antifa in 2020 and 2021. And we are certainly see, seeing that now with trans activism, which has shown itself to be extremely violent in nature. And so, but Riley did point this out. And I think it's worth saying that she pointed this out, that if the roles were reversed, like if this were at Liberty University, okay, which is a pretty conservative university in Virginia, and some kind of queer activist, some kind of trans activist showed up to give a speech about the importance of trans inclusion in sports. And this is what happened. You had a bunch of conservative students, a bunch of scary, toxic white males chasing this poor, quote unquote, trans woman into a room extorting her. They would be charged by the DOJ with terrorism. They would be going to prison for years. The media would still be talking about this. They wouldn't stop talking about this. They would say, this is the same spirit of the January 6th insurrection. See, white supremacist transphobic terrorism is the greatest threat to this country. They would be memorializing this day. They would be talking about it for the next several years to point to the fact that anti-trans hate is such a big and pervasive part of our country and Donald Trump supporters and Christianity and white evangelicals are all a part of it. That would be the narrative and it would be constant. But now it's very hushed. Like you never see people on the left the way that you see people on the right saying, you know, saying, you know, I'm for, I'm for, uh, you know, transgender inclusion, but I really feel pressure to condemn that. I'm going to condemn that violence. I'm going to call that out. I just, I feel pressure to post on my Instagram or post on Twitter that I am not a part of that group. People on the left or people even center left never feel the pressure to do that. They never do. They're very uniform in their, uh, in their public activism, where pe whereas people on the right would say, you know, I support Donald Trump, but I don't support that. Or I support, you know, fairness in women's sports, but I don't support that. Like we feel a lot of pressure to make sure that people know that we're not a part of that extreme group over there to clarify our stance and to make sure it's nuanced, to make sure it's properly caveated. People on the left never feel like they have to do that because they know they have cover. They have cover in the media. They even have cover in some of their churches. They have cover from the federal government. They have cover from the corporations. And so they don't have to say, you know, I believe Black Lives Matter, but I'm not in support of those riots. You really didn't see people on the left saying that. Even professing Christians, riots are the voice of the unheard. I don't think that we should criticize these riots because we don't understand. Maybe, maybe looting's okay in the face of injustice. Like you actually saw 
you actually saw progressive people and people in the center left and even professing Christians saying that during 2020. But anything that is uncomfortable on the right that happens or that we don't agree with, we all feel like we have to make some kind of like public response to kind of justify our, ourselves and justify being on the side that we are. Um, so we haven't gotten any kind of response. We haven't gotten any kind of response from Joe Biden about this kind of violence. And as far as I know, we haven't seen any kind of statement from the White House. Instead, again, the White House is focused on the fact that apparently trans people are the ones who are under attack. And they've made this announcement over and over again, even after a person who claimed to be transgender murdered six people at a Christian school in Nashville. There was also the story out of Colorado. I don't know if you saw this, that thankfully police arrested a person who identified as transgender who had plans to shoot up a school. And so apparently this is a thing now, but we have to pretend that transphobia is the real problem. Not that this ideology is inherently violent, which it is. I'm not saying all people who are confused about their gender or who want to pretend that they can identify as the opposite sex are violent or want to hurt people. But the ideology itself, the activism that is on the front lines, even the organizations leading this cause, yes, they are inherently violent. And they believe that violence is justified in the face of what they would call discrimination. And so that's why they are totally okay with harassing, with intimidating someone like Riley Gaines. They don't actually care about women's rights. They don't care about empathy and compassion. They don't actually care about inclusion. They care about their ideology. This is what progressivism is and does. It creates a lot of anger. It creates a lot of unrest. It creates discontentment. It creates this desire, this need to destroy. And actually, James said this morning, I'll just steal his talking point that he was able to give me before we actually had to end the interview and just say that we'll reschedule it. He believes that the reason why this is accelerating, because this movement does seem to be accelerating, the reason why it's accelerating is because the gender ideology movement realizes that it's actually not going that well for them, that things actually don't look that good, that people are starting to realize, normal people are starting to realize that, hey, I'm not sure it's totally fair that men are competing against women. Like, I'm not sure it's totally fair that women and girls are getting the short end of the stick, that no longer their privacy is protected, no longer their safety is cared about, no longer their fairness to compete on an equal playing field in sports is something that is prioritized. I don't think this is right. And the more and more ridiculous it gets, I think the harder it is for people not to say, okay, I just can't be on board with this. All right. Another pause to tell you guys about range leather, another amazing sponsor that I have. This is a Christian owned company. They make all of their own products out of Wyoming. So this is all American made. This is a company that shares the values that you and I do, and they've got amazing leather products. So they make wallets, they make belts, they make purses, they make earrings, all kinds of amazing jewelry. I love their leather earrings. I wear them all the time. I also love their leather bag. I mean, this stuff really lasts. So women, Father's Day and men for Mother's Day, these things are coming up. Okay. These days are coming up. I'm here to remind you. And if you want to give your husband or wife something that is high quality, thoughtful, that they will really love, that they'll be able to use all the time for years to come, then you should consider that uh, getting them something from Range Leather. Plus you're supporting a company that supports the values, the principles that you and I have. I love this company. I love their products. Go to rangeleather.com. Use code Allie at checkout. You'll get 15% off your first order. That's rangeleather.com. Code Allie for 15% off your first order. Rangeleather.com. Code Allie. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw, and I don't even have it in my document, but it just came to mind. Um, I'm not sure who I first saw a tweet about it, but there is this ballerina and let's see, that goes by the name of Sophia Rebecca, who has admitted 
in 2017 to the Royal Academy of Dance, which is very prestigious. And this person is a man who identifies as a woman. And not only that, but he is actually legitimately a bad ballerina. Like he is bad at dancing. Okay. I'm not a dancer. He may be better than me. And I say maybe like, I don't actually, I don't actually know. Like I'm not confident in saying that. Um, but I know that he's not good. Like I've seen toddler dance recitals and I am fairly confident that three-year-olds who have been training in ballet for six months are a better dancer than him. And yet I guarantee you, he, uh, he was, uh, moved to the front of the line in front of women who are actually good at ballet in order to be admitted into the Royal Academy of Dance. Let me just play you this clip of sweet, dainty, six foot three, I don't know, 220 pound Sophia, Rebecca, the beautiful and elegant ballerina. <laughs> Okay. So as you saw, like you have seen rugby players more delicate than that, right? And look, this person might have been a good male dancer. I don't know. It honestly doesn't look like he has had very much training at all. Apparently he started trying to, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. It's playing on repeat in front of me and it's, it's laughable. It's laughable. Oh my gosh. This is like watching Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, uh, apparently he started dancing in his thirties and then he got accepted to the Royal Academy of dance. And so this is like gender affirmative action. You can't cut, you can't cut it as a man. And so you identify as the opposite sex and you get all these privileges more than the women who have worked very hard to be in that position receive. And so that's how it goes. The so-called patriarchy strikes again, so-called toxic masculinity wins again. And yet all of these women, liberal women, are clapping like seals, saying, no, this is great, using freaking she, her pronouns for that behemoth of a person saying, oh, no, I'm just being polite and inclusive. No, you're not. You are affirming a lie. You're actually a liar. You are a liar. And you are selling out women every time you call a man she or her. Don't say, well, I'm against inclusion of men and these things. I, I believe in fairness and equality for women. I believe in women's rights and then turn around and call a man she. Don't do it. You're a giant hypocrite. You're just scared. You're just scared. You're just scared to say what is true. You're not being polite. You're not being empathetic. You're not being respectful. You're not being compassionate. You are lying because you're scared of people calling you a bad person. Also, did you see that Megan Rapinoe and... What's the other girl's name? I don't know that much about women's sports, but uh, Megan Rapinoe and Sue Bird, they signed this statement um, saying that they are against any kind of transgender ban in women's professional sports. And so they are saying, yes, we want men who identify as women to compete against other women and girls. Again, for the sake of inclusion, for the sake of love, for the sake of tolerance. No, what's really going on here is that they're scared. They're scared. These women are scared. These former professional athletes are scared. They're scared of the trans mob. They're scared of the progressive activist class that they have now joined for the sake of social points, for the sake of prominence and a platform. They know that they have to be on the left in order to get these brand deals, in order to get these sponsorships, in order to uh, continue to make money post their athletic career. And so they are saying what they are being told that they must say in order to stay relevant, that yes, we should include all quote unquote transgender people in women's sports. Now here's what's convenient about this. What's convenient about this is that Megan Rapinoe and Sue Bird have already finished their careers. So they don't have to worry about competing against men. In fact, if they had to compete against men, 
when they were actually competing in athletics, they would not be where they are. We would only know the men's names who identify as women. We would not know the name Megan Rapinoe if she had been forced to abide by the policies that she is now pushing for. And so it's all selfish. It's all self-serving. It, uh, it is all so cowardly. She is already successful. She's finished her career. And so rather than turning around and helping other girls and women who have worked very hard to get to the point that she has, she's pulling up the ladder behind her and saying, no, I got here, but I don't want you to ever get here. And how I am going to ensure that you little girl who loves soccer will never get to where I am is to ensure that there are boys, that there are men that are competing against you, that you will never be able to beat out. And again, how do I know that these girls and women will never be able to fairly compete against men? Because Megan Rapinoe is on that soccer team that competed against 15-year-old boys, the U.S. women's soccer team that competed against 15-year-old boys and lost. Megan knows that. Megan knows that she, at her best, in her prime, lost to a bunch of 15-year-old ninth grade boys. And yet she's saying, sure, I think high school men should play against uh, high school women, college, professional level. I think that's great. It's all selfish. It's not about inclusion. It's not about acceptance. Again, it's not about empathy or being a good person. It's actually about being self-serving. She just doesn't care. She just doesn't care about the women coming up after her. She doesn't actually care about the sport that elevated her to the place where she is today. She certainly doesn't care about other girls who don't have the platform and who don't have the privileges that she does. It's all performative and it's so cowardly. It's so cowardly. And all of these people pretend to be so courageous to be on the right side of history. Look, you're on the side of delusion. You're on the side of humiliating women. You're on the side of abuse. You're on the side of injustice. You can be kind to people who are confused about their gender. You can be nice to them, but you don't have to affirm their delusions. If you have a friend who believes that they are fat and who tries to cancel out her calories every day by working out more than she eats, She's a rail. She's really skinny. But every time she looks at her reflection, she sees a little pinch of fat on her hips or too much fat on her thighs. Or maybe she thinks that her face is filled out and she's ugly. She has body dysmorphia. She looks at herself and she thinks that she's something that she's not. Are you a kind, loving friend if you say, hey, fatty, like, why don't you go on a diet? You know what, girl, you are right. Why don't you run another mile? You are fat. You know what? You're actually obese and you do need to lose weight. Are you a loving friend for doing that? No, you're actually very hateful to her. You are affirming a lie that is destructive to her body. And really, if believed on a widespread level, would be destructive to society as a whole. Now, the uncomfortable, but the more loving option would be to say, look, what you see in the mirror, what you think about your body isn't true. And I know you don't want to hear this. Maybe you don't want to be my friend anymore. Maybe you think that this is unkind, but look, I'm saying it because I love you and because I care about reality that so you don't have any fat on your body. And actually like you need to gain weight. I want you to live a long time. I want to reconcile your mind with your body, not the other way around. And I want to get us to a healthy place. So like, let's get help. Let's talk about this. I want to be your friend, but because I love you, I have to affirm physical reality rather than deny it. Now, why, when it comes to, I won't even call it gender dysphoria because I don't think that most of this men, these men, or even a lot of these women actually have gender dysphoria. I think that they, it's a social contagion. I think it's pornography. I think it's past experiences with sexual trauma. I think it's all kinds of things that are not actually diagnoses of, um, gender dysphoria. But when it comes to gender confusion, identity confusion, we take the opposite approach and we say, no, we need to reconcile your body with your mind. Your mind is all messed up. Your mind is all confused. You see something in the mirror, you feel something that just isn't true. It's not attached to reality. And so we're going to try to change your body, to conform to that confusion in your mind. I mean, there's a reason why 
the thoughts of suicide and self-harm still persist after that it has nothing to do with society, it has everything to do with the fact that you never actually treated the underlying problem, which is a psychological and emotional and even, I would say, spiritual problem that is going on in the hearts and the minds and the souls of these people who are gender confused. You don't address that. You just cut up their body, mutilate their body. You affirm a lie. That's not loving. That's not kind. Like, so be courageous enough to actually love people in a way that they might deem not nice. That's what we as Christians understand. I mean, if you look at the gospels, if you look at the life of Jesus, if you look at the words of Jesus, he was often very harsh. Like as someone who believes in telling the truth, even when it hurts people's feelings, I sometimes read the words of Jesus or the words of God in the epistles. And I think, ouch, I don't like that. You know, I don't like that tone. Sometimes it seems like Jesus, even for me, someone who is okay with sarcasm is a little too sarcastic for me. Like if it were up to me, maybe I'd police his tone. But gosh, I even have a hard time saying that right now because far be it from me to try to criticize or chastise or tone police the God of the universe who is love, 1 John 4, 8. We as Christians should understand this better than anyone if we're following the example of Jesus that the most loving thing to say and do is not always the nice thing. It's not always the affirming thing. It's not always the thing that is going to be the easiest for the recipient to digest and hear and if we truly love the way that God loves, we have to be okay with that. I know you're constantly hearing a message from the world uh, that says that in order to be a true Christian, in order to be truly loving, then you have to be okay with everyone's lifestyle. You have to be okay with everyone's choices. You have to affirm everyone's delusions, but that's not true. That's not the biblical example that is set for us. That's not the, the, the Jesus example that is set for us. And by the way, don't be beholden to the opinions of those who don't even believe in the existence of right and wrong, really, who don't even believe in the existence of sin, who really hate so much of what Jesus said. They hate so much of what the Bible has to say. If those people don't love Christ, if they don't love his church, if they don't love God's word, then they're not going to love truth. And so you shouldn't be beholden to their standards of what love is or what hate is. That's a lot of what my upcoming book is about, by the way, how fake and toxic empathy has led especially Christian women into believing things about culture and politics and moral issues that are just not true, that are just not true. So you see here, like someone like Riley Gaines and all of the people who are affected by this, people who don't have public platforms, who don't get to go on Tucker Carlson tonight and who don't get a bunch of people on Twitter to rally behind them, they're dealing with this stuff on a daily basis in a private way, in a very hurtful way. They're losing friends. They're losing their status in their community. Maybe they're losing their jobs. Girls are losing scholarships. They're losing opportunities. They're losing privacy. And they're told that you can't say anything. And so we who do have a platform, any platform, whether it's five people, whether it's five million people, whatever place you have in the tiny sphere or the large sphere that you occupy on this universe, use whatever opportunity you have to speak and do and represent that which is good and right and true. I know a lot of people, they don't want to talk about this gender issue. They don't want to talk about the abortion issue because they call it a culture war issue. They call it a political problem. They don't want to be divisive. They don't want to hurt relationships. Oh, I just want to love people. You hear that a lot. People who say that almost always fall on the left wing of issues. And they're so naive and just like wrong about those issues because they're unwilling to think about it in a logical way, in a practical way. They think that they're so-called leading with empathy and leading with empathy when it comes to these issues actually leads you to make really stupid decisions and suggestions in the way of policy and these cultural and social and moral and even theological issues because you sway from the truth in order to appease someone's feelings. So a lot of people won't wade into these issues because they're afraid of being mean. But look, for the Christian, these are not primarily culture war issues. They're not primarily political issues. The issue of God making us male and female, the issue of biology is a theological issue for us. It's a biblical issue. It is a Genesis one issue. It's actually even more than a Genesis one issue that says God made us in his image, male and female. It's a Genesis one 
one issue. God created the heavens and the earth. Look, if he created the heavens and the earth and that changes everything, he's the creator of all things. That means he's the authority over all things. He says what is and what isn't, what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, what's true and what's false, what's male and what's female. And so if we believe that, that God is the authority over all of it, that he created the heavens and the earth, then we have no other choice but to submit to him, submit to his definitions and to submit to his standards. That's actually the most loving thing that we can do. So when we're talking about the travesty of abortion, or when we're talking about the reality of male and female, when we're talking about the definition of marriage, when we're talking about children's rights, not just to be born without being murdered, but also their right to a mother and a father. Um, even their right when it comes to how they're conceived through reproductive technology and surrogacy, like for the Christian, these are not primarily these culture war issues. These are primarily for the Christian biblical issues, Genesis one issues, Genesis one, one issues. And so that's how I really approach this podcast. That's how I approach all of these issues is that, okay, according to God's authority, what is true in this situation? And if it is true, according to God, it is also automatically and inherently loving. Because first John four, eight says that God is love. And Genesis 127 says he made us male and female. Therefore, the most loving thing that I can do is agree with and affirm that. There's a lot of Christians out there who think that they need to let God off the hook. They need to soften his word. They need to make it a little bit more palatable for the world. Um, because they believe that they're more loving and compassionate than God. And they're not, they're not, that is serving the God of self, not the God of scripture. All right. So we covered all that kind of meandering. I wasn't prepared for this episode really how I wanted it to be because I, we, I was originally going to talk to James. So forgive my kind of stream of consciousness there. Okay. I'm really only going to talk about one more thing. And that is this transformation church story that you're seeing circulate on Twitter. Um, so let's talk about that. All right. Next sponsor for the day is relief band. Okay. So I got out of my first trimester not too long ago. I guess I'm about halfway through my second trimester now, but first trimester, it was rough. Those of you who have dealt with morning sickness, I really have this, uh, this third time, you know how debilitating it can be and it can really inhibit you from living your day to day life. And if you're like me, you also don't like taking a bunch of medications, especially when you're pregnant. So if you are in the throes of morning sickness or any kind of nausea, if you struggle with sickness because of anxiety or motion sickness, or maybe when you're just traveling, you get nausea, or if you're going through chemotherapy treatments right now and it's making you nauseous, you should try relief band. So this is a drug free solution to nausea that really works. It's worked for 20 years. It was originally developed for chemotherapy patients, but works for all kinds of people who suffer with or who suffer from nausea. So it's a band that you put on your wrist. It simulates the nerve in your wrist that communicates to your uh, brain to tell your stomach to stop getting sick, to stop throwing up. I mean, this can be a real life changer, especially if you are someone who suffers from chronic nausea. My sister-in-law gets motion sickness. She said that this has really worked for her. So I encourage you to check it out. It could be a total game changer for you. Go to reliefband.com. Uh, reliefband.com slash Allie, reliefband.com slash Allie, R E L I E F B A N D.com slash Allie. Use code Allie at checkout for 20% off plus free shipping. Reliefband.com slash Allie. Use code Allie for 20% off plus free shipping. Reliefband.com slash Allie. All right. So I said that I was going to talk about the Dylan Mulvaney stuff and I was thinking as I was talking, I really want to save that for James because James has some interesting things to say about that and why these corporations are making the choices that they are. Um, and so I'm just going to save it. I'm going to save it. I know it's not going to be quite as timely if I wait until then, but I'm going to talk about it with him and, uh, yeah, we'll discuss that. I just want to talk about this transformation church thing. 
<laughs> so we've talked about Mike Todd before. I talked about him a couple weeks ago. Um, basically apologizing for God. Actually, this is a perfect transition because he is the kind of person, he's the kind of pastor. He's a pastor of a huge church in Tulsa. And he is the kind of person that I'm talking about that he feels like he has to let God off the hook. You know, he did this whole rant in a sermon saying, you know, if it were up to me and I'm paraphrasing here, you can go back and listen. I don't think that I am at all misrepresenting the core of his argument. Again, go back and listen to that. We played the context. I'm certainly not trying to be inflammatory here. Basically, in sum, what he argued was, if it were up to me, I would have lots of genders. If it were up to me, I wouldn't. it wouldn't just be male and female. If it were up to me, the issue of male-female marriage, it would be a lot more up in the air. There would be a lot more flexibility there, but that's just what God God's word says. I gave him some credit. I gave him some credit about that sermon for at least saying that this is what God's word says, but the constant apologizing for it, the constant uh, attempts at softening it so he doesn't get in too much trouble by the progressive left, it's just abhorrent to me. Again, it's just assuming that you are more loving than God and God is just too mean. He's just too harsh. I saw uh, Gabe Finocchio talk about this and it was so good how he was talking about this, how he was just kind of making fun of people who do this and specifically Mike Todd, that it's basically like, oh, I'm just sorry for my boss, man. He's so he's so awful. I know he's so terrible. It's not my policy. It, it's his like, you know, complaining about the manager behind his back. Oh, I know. I know. Oh, no, dude, I, I get it. I hate this policy, too. It's so awful. It's so awful. And if it were up to me, I wouldn't have this policy at all. But the man upstairs, he's just a he's just a tough guy to tough guy to deal with. Like, do you think that that is the tone of someone or that is the choice of words of someone who fears God, who loves God, who loves his word. No, that's someone who is embarrassed by it, but understands that he has this platform ostensibly for being a pastor. And so he has to actually at least pretend to like the Bible and like God. And yet he's going to constantly try to soften God and who he is and pretend that he is actually more loving than him. Okay, so that's Mike Todd. That's Transformation Church. He's had a lot of other issues. He also just hired Carl Lentz from Hillsong. So lots and lots of issues, I think, with Mike Todd and his church, that some of which we've talked about in the past, which is really just sad. There's also very like mainstream, some of which you know, and probably as Christian women you follow, mainstream organizations and conferences who have platformed Mike Todd and his words, despite the fact that he has not proven himself at all to be an ambassador of the gospel. I'm sorry, dude, you haven't. Like, I think that the Lord can change you. I think that he can give you courage. I think he can give you boldness if you are actually willing to submit to him and submit to his words. But as it is right now, totally, totally irresponsible with the platform that he has been given. So he did an Easter service. All right. I don't know. I guess you could call it this. And it was this entire performance. And I'm going to play you a clip of it. Easter, when there are people who come to church who have never been to church before or who typically don't go to church, but they feel some kind of pressure to at least go to church on Christmas and Easter. Maybe that's what they're used to or growing up, or maybe they saw the advertisements for it. If they walked into Transformation Church on Easter Sunday, this montage, and it's kind of long, this montage is what they were met with. Dragon, this is what you need to do. Step one, find you a baddie. Okay. But step two, she gotta have a fatty. Hey. <laughs> 
Tighten up some ass. Look back at it. Uh-oh. What is she doing? Friends, I don't have a fatty. Bro, Girl, we keep telling you it's okay. Your little booty matter too, friend. Oh, Y'all know they don't be discriminating. Okay, I don't even know what to say. I'm not against performances. As, I mean, that's not how it is at my church. I, I'm not against productions, okay? I'm not against creativity. I'm not against, I'm not saying that every church has to be like my church, that every church has to be buttoned up the way that some churches are. I'm not saying that all churches have to have the same forms of worship and the same kind of Easter service. But do I think that the church's primary role is to glorify God and to edify believers with the word of God and with the gospel? Do I think that everything done at a church should be pointing to the Lord? Yes, I do. Is that what you got out of this? No, it is entirely inappropriate. You have women basically twerking on stage, but hey, it's twerking for the kingdom. We're twerking for the Lord out here. Woohoo! Apparently that is supposed to, um, that's supposed to bring people to God. That is supposed to share the gospel with people. Now, Mike Todd got up on stage and he talked about why they made the choices that they did with these kinds of performances. In 2015, um, I became the pastor and I didn't know what a pastor did. And so I was meeting with a group of people and they was like, what should we do for Easter? I was like, I've never preached the Easter message. So I'm not going to start this year. We need to come up with an Easter play. And they was like, all right, let's do it. I said, but it can't be no whack, raggedy. I just, he got up. Like, it just cannot be that. Okay, y'all gonna act like I'm the only one that saw like, oh, yay. That was good. Like, I was like, it's got to move people. And I really wanted to be focused on people who don't know God or are far from him. I want the person who feels lonely and isolated and like God doesn't care. I want them to see how amazing Jesus actually is and what God actually did for all of us. So I said, we're going to go to the edge on this. And they said, Pastor, how far on the edge are we going to go? I said, we're going to do everything short of sin. So I never preached an Easter message, so I'm not going to start this year. We need to come up with an Easter play. I guess you could call it that. I don't even know if you could call it that. Like, okay, if you don't know what to do, if you don't know what to do as a pastor, just read the Bible. Just read. Just read from the book of Mark. Just read about Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. Just do that. That's actually the best sermon that you could ever preach because you know that every single word you say is inerrant and infallible. That'll be the only sermon that you've ever preached that is completely and totally infallible and inerrant and without, uh, without any kind of self-serving piece to it. And I'm not criticizing pastors. It's just true because we're all human. And so we are prone to error, but God's word is not. And so if we just read from God's word, if you don't know what else to say, if you don't know what else to add, then that would be a perfectly fine sermon. If that's all Mike Todd did was read from the Bible, that would have been infinity times better than what he offered his congregants, which had nothing to do with God in his glory whatsoever. What a lost opportunity, man. Maybe a great opportunity for you, maybe a way for you to raise your celebrity status, but what a waste. And like Mike Todd, I, I don't believe that he is some like mean person. Maybe he believes that he is doing the right thing. I don't know. Maybe he's sincere in some way. I think he has a lot of talent but man, God could use that talent in a way that could transform the city that his church is in, that could transform the congregants there if he would just speak the truth in love without fear, unapologetically, unabashedly, consistently every week. 
Wow. Wow. Talk about transformation, right? Instead, we got this. What an embarrassment. This is not what the church is for. Okay, last sponsor for the day, and that is Eden Pure. If you want to make sure that the air that your family is breathing is clean, free of bacteria, free of viruses, also free of just bad odors, then you need an air purifier from Eden Pure. It uses O3 technology to kill all of these things, eliminate all of these things in your home. And the Thunderstorm air purifier from Eden Pure plugs right into your wall. So it doesn't take up any space. You turn it on. You don't even notice it. You can also travel with it. Like if you're worried about the air that you're breathing in hotel rooms, which I totally understand, you can just pack one of your Eden Pure's, your Thunderstorms in your bag and you are good to go. A lot of times these air purifiers, like the high quality, high end kinds, they cost a ton of money, but for my audience, they're giving you an amazing discount. You can save $200 on an Eden Pure Thunderstorm three pack. So whole home protection, you can put this in all the rooms in your home. If you want to, you'll save $200 three units for under $200. If you go to EdenPureDeals.com, use code Allie at checkout. That's EdenPureDeals.com. Use code Allie to save $200. Shipping is free. EdenPureDeals.com, code Allie. But I just want to give an encouragement for all pastors who preached God's word this weekend. Maybe you felt that it wasn't the best sermon ever. Maybe you felt like you stumbled over your words. Maybe you felt like, oh, you wish you would have said something different, or you had a thought that you wish you would have added to your sermon, or maybe you feel like not enough people were there and you're wondering why you're even doing what you're doing. Look, if you exposited the word of God this weekend, if you preached God's word, if you preached Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection, then you did your job. You stewarded the role, the responsibility that God gave you. And the word of God does not return void. And God is not measuring your obedience by the perfection of your performance behind the pulpit. Now, I think communication skills are really important for pastors. I think being able to properly and persuasively exposit God's word is really important for pastors. I think that there are a lot of pastors who don't think that learning how to communicate clearly effectively is important. And that's really a shame, but no matter how great of a communicator you think you are, no matter how flashy the performances or the productions were at your church, no matter how many people were in the seats or the pews at your church, like if you faithfully and humbly preach the word of God this weekend, then you did your job and praise God for that. If you had 15 people in front of you hearing you preach the gospel about Jesus's resurrection, I guarantee you that had far more impact than what Mike Todd's church did in front of thousands of people. And thank God for that. I mean, that should really alleviate all of us of a lot of pressure to perform and to gain followers and to grow our platform as long as we are stewarding whatever opportunities, whatever space that we have by trying to submit to God's authority, Genesis 1-1, then that's really what matters. God is going to use that. God's going to use that. All right. That's all I got for us today. Probably had a lot more that I could have added to that if I had had the opportunity to prepare, but those are my, those are my quick thoughts. Maybe we'll talk more about it later this week. Uh, all right. We will, maybe we'll talk about some of the things that I wanted to talk about today, tomorrow. Like I want to talk about that Tennessee three thing and how they're misusing scripture to advocate for their left-wing policy. So hopefully we'll be able to get to that sometime this week. All right. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Leave us a five-star review. If you love this podcast, go to AllieMerch.com. Use code Ally 10 for a discount on all of our awesome merch. You won't regret it. And I will see you guys back here tomorrow.